27, Psalm 27. And I want to say in advance, thank you for praying for my wife and I as we travel this coming week. We're going to leave today, hopefully make it as far as West Virginia, and then be in Virginia for about, I think, about eight or nine days and spend time with family. And of course, especially with our youngest grandson, we're looking forward to that. So we're looking forward to our time away with family, and thank you for praying for us. Today we sang um, two songs that draw content from Psalm 27. Uh, the first one, um, of course, written by David, but actually composed by our own music worship director, is entitled Psalm 27, and so we sang the first half of that psalm today. Um, but the other song that we sang today was Better is One Day, which includes a common desire that we should have as believers, and that is to draw near to Him, and as the psalmist states, to behold the beauty of the Lord. Um, and because we are traveling, and I'm going to be gone for a week, I didn't want to get back into Luke quite yet, because we started a new section, so we're going to do that a couple weeks from now. I thought it'd be enjoyable for us to look at Psalm 27. Um, there's a lot to be said in this psalm. We won't cover all of it. But I would like to say this by way of introduction. Uh, the Word of God, as it goes forth, always accomplishes the purposes of God. Um, and I think it's important to note, it doesn't always accomplish our purposes. I think there's lots of times we wish we could read the Bible or state it to someone else, and that would just fix everything. Um, it always goes forth, though, and it accomplishes God's purposes. And I was reminded of that, especially this last week after Easter services. It was fascinating. There were so many comments, not about the exacting details of the message, but interesting about other biblical concepts that were mentioned. Uh, for some folks, it was a reminder that as we press on and draw near to God, we have to forget what is behind us. Now, someone did mention to me last night, we have to remember that Christ saved us in the past. That's definitely a good thing to remember. But as it relates to those things that we think are so valuable and those things that would beset us, we are to forget those things and press on. Everyone who has lived a sufficient number of years has a story to tell about past pain. And especially those who find themselves having some harsh experience, just that internal agony that sometimes goes with it for years and years. I was even thinking about last night about those things that are said to us when we're children. Um, how many of you can still look back to something that was said to you that was harsh when you were a child, and it's almost like it's right there, it's right in front of you. It's kind of like going back and visiting your childhood home, or your high school, or your um, elementary school, and those smells just bring all that right back to your mind. But as Christians, we're supposed to forget about those things which are in the past that would be harmful to us. We're to look for those things which are ahead. It requires that we would not be defined by our past, not be controlled by it, and not contained by it. So where does it sound? We're to be a progressive people. If there's going to be a progressive people, it should be Christians who are striving to know the Lord, who's called us to Himself, and to be made more and more like Him. For other folks, it was interesting. It was the fact that God moves us as His children from life to life, from new life until that eternal life in His, in his glory. And all the while, it includes suffering in this world. And I mentioned last week, we are very blessed at our church. Our members really suffer well for Christ. Um, I've seen it through the years that our people, that when they go through hard times, they keep their eyes on Christ. Now, I'm not saying that it's easy. And anybody would testify who's gone through a difficult season. It can just bring you down to nothing. But our people continue to testify that God is good, that He remains a good God, and He takes care of us. And someone stated part of the reason that we are well prepared is because you, Pastor Steve, remind us often that we're going to suffer in this world. Uh, they said that you have prepared us well. Um, we don't hear those messages which tickle our ears, but rather the whole counsel of God's Word that tells us that life isn't going to be a bed of roses for us as Christians. Our psalm today continues these themes, themes of pressing on, even though we face adversity. In this psalm, we'll be reminded once again of who our great God and Savior is, but we'll also be able to increase our confidence as we grapple with the initial question that the psalmist raises, whom shall I fear? And with that, of whom shall I be afraid? Um, we're not really sure of the context of which uh, it is written, but it's written by David according to historical records. And I'd invite you to stand with me for the reading of just the first couple of verses here, Psalm 27. And I'll read verses 1 through 6 today. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. 
One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble He shall hide me in His pavilion, in the secret place of His tabernacle He shall hide me, He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer the sacrifices of joy in His tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. I'd like to ask Mike Muehlhauser if you'd ask God to bless us as we look at His Word at this time. Most Heavenly Father, as we think back on some of the songs today, describing Your mercy and Your grace, mm. Lord, it's just abounding in our lives, and we thank You for that. We thank you for the calming spirit you can give to us today at the time that uh, Pastor leads us in the uh, your words to be spoken to us. We ask for um, grace to be upon Pastor Steve at this time too, and we just ask that you uh, provide us with the, the wisdom that we need for this week. We just give you thanks in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. For those of you who like to take notes, the first half I'm going to try and teach the basic thoughts in this passage, and then the second part we'll do some more, I think, things that will hopefully just encourage us in our journey. To, if you want to understand the Psalms, I think one of the most important things you can do is look for the structure of the Psalm. This particular Psalm is divided into two sections, and each of the sections have at its bookends the name Jehovah. So the, the section begins with Jehovah, it ends with Jehovah, and then the second section begins with Jehovah and ends with Jehovah. The first section is a reminder that we're to set our gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, the beauty of Jehovah. In order to do this, we have to know who He is, and then as a result of seeing His beauty, we will offer the sacrifice of joy, we will sing praises to Jehovah. The second section talks about drawing near to Him so that we are face to face with the Lord. So there's a movement in this psalm looking at His beauty, and then looking in His eyes, being ever closer. So I was thinking about this last night. It made me think about our middle grandson, our second one. Um, he and I are buddies right now. If we see each other across the room, he just lights up seeing his paw, like paw is the greatest thing ever, and my wife knows it's true. Um, and then when he lights up like that, I just I can't stop looking at him because he's so, so cute. I mean, he's just too cute. And but then when he wants to be near, he puts out his hands and I take him in my arms and he just looks at me right in my face. And then he just puts his head down right here and it's like, okay, I'm good for the rest of my life. That's all I need. And there's that movement here of seeing him, his beauty at a distance, but then drawing near face to face and just snuggling up close is the idea of the psalm here. So this movement, we'll see this in this passage. And I think that this movement drawing close often happens as we cry out to the Lord. There are times we cry out in distress. Sometimes it's in godly sorrow which leads to conviction. And sometimes it's just in utter desperation as we once again recognize we really need Him. As a result of seeking His face, we're reminding ourselves but others to be patient in the process, to wait upon the Lord, to wait upon Jehovah. So let's begin with the beauty of the Lord. There's absolutely no question in verse 1. David knows the Lord. He states that Jehovah is my light and my salvation. He is the strength of my life. Now, that Jehovah is both our light, and I'm including us in this as well. Jehovah is both our light and our salvation. Both of these titles, both of these references are in reference to the redemption that we have in Christ Jesus. He is our light. The light that shines in the darkness to break sin's dominion. It's the light that transforms a child of the evil one into a child of God. It's the light that comes upon us to move us, to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His glorious Son. He is our light, and He is our salvation. If you ever think about it, from before time began, until time has no meaning, He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, and He will keep us for all eternity. This is a promise of God. No one, no one can snatch us out of His hand. We are secure. And in the in-between time, it's so sweet. He is the strength of our lives. He not only empowers us for all the good works that He's ordained, but He protects us. 
And we need His protection. There is a struggle, and the psalmist here speaks of it. It's not just what has happened, but is what will happen, may, what may occur. And the enemies are identified as the wicked, as the enemies, as foes. And yet David is confident. Look at verse 3. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this I will be confident. Now the confidence here that, that David had, the psalmist had, is not in what he could do, what he might have been able to do. He's not suggesting that he has sufficient strength or power to remove his fear or the enemies. But rather his confidence looked back to what he already said. The Lord is my light and my salvation. He is the strength of my life. And so he makes a request in verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Doesn't that sound good? To behold the beauty of the Lord, and there to inquire in His temple. I find David's request to be his resolve. He wanted to be with Jehovah, to gaze upon His beauty, and in the meantime, he knew that Jehovah was his surety. Listen to verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And so David understood that the Lord would either hide him or set him on high ground. Either way, he was safe. Jehovah would protect him, grant him the victory. David's head would be lifted up above his enemies. And therefore, the resolve at the end is what we sang today. David wanted to sing praises to the Lord. Verse 6, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer the sacrifices of joy in His tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. To know the Lord. To know Jehovah. To know who He is. To be confident in knowing Him. To know what He has done in the past. To be assured that He'll be faithful in the future. To behold His beauty to gaze upon Him, the One who is kind to His children. What else can we do but offer praises to Him? It just makes our heart want to sing no matter what's going on. Now I'm persuaded that we're able to receive this psalm as more than just an example, and it's a great example. I think I am persuaded that we can enter in and receive this from the Lord. I think He's given it to us to assist us in our time of need as well, to cry out to Him with the words that He provides. I recently was talking with some believers, and they are right now on one of those paths that is just going to be, it's going to be, it's just going to be harsh. They're going to need God's mercy every moment, not just when they're awake, but even when they're asleep. It's going to be agonizing. And I know they're going to be reduced, and they're going to be reduced, and they're going to be reduced. And they're going to get to the place where they're like, can't handle anymore. And they're going to cry out to God. And, they, and as we were talking, they said, is there any passages of Scripture that you would encourage us to look at during this time? I said, yeah, I'll live in the Psalms. Live in the Psalms. Begin in Psalm 23 and work your way maybe up to 30. And if you want to go deeper, go all the way through Psalm 42 and 43. I said, in the hour of need, I think these Psalms, Psalms 23 through 43, the Lord has just given us so that the things that we can't express, He says, here's the words that you need to cry out to God. We begin with Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Are there, those words are so sweet, aren't they? Jehovah is my shepherd. I shall not want. There's nothing that I lack. He gives me everything that I need. Not everything that I want, but everything that I need. And if you should make your way all the way to Psalm 42 and 43, those sister psalms where, where the psalmist cries out in weakness, and it's interesting, it's a cry to self. Why are you so unsettled within me, O oh my soul? Why are you so distraught? Why are you so anxious? Hope in God. For I will yet praise Him, my God and my Savior. Three times the psalmist echoes the same thing. Have you ever been there where you're just like, why are you so discouraged? Why are you so anxious? Why are you so unsettled. Get your eyes back on Christ. Hope in Him. He is my God. He is my Savior. Now, now granted, we're not going to be attacked with swords and shields. Most likely, maybe it will come. I don't know. But there are so many things that come against us. You can just look to the past, to the present, and to the future. 
in the past all the things of regrets and failures and sorrows and pain. I mentioned to someone last week as they came up to me in tears just talking about they recognized they needed to just be done with all of those hardships of the past. And I mentioned to that individual as I do to some others, there are, the trajectory I was on from my childhood, I should be in a ditch somewhere right now. If it weren't for the grace of God, that's where I should be. If it weren't for the Lord, I would be one of those who would probably be harming myself and if I could, harming others if I, I would try to. But, but God. But God. You look to the present, our, our health concerns, mourning the loss of loved ones. And someone just mentioned today, you know, I think I'm doing okay, but we all need times to mourn and to grieve our losses, don't we? We've got financial stresses at times, and then now we've got this whole new category of things that trigger us. It can be, again, something that we smell or something that we see or something that's said, and all of a sudden, there it is, right there. It can be the unknowns of the future. And it's interesting, the Bible tells us, don't worry about tomorrow. It says tomorrow can take care of itself. It can worry about itself. And yet often do we ask of God for grace, for something in the future that may never happen. But somehow we think we need it. It may never occur. If we can, though, let's focus on the central theme of this first half of this psalm. Namely, that we need to behold the beauty of the Lord. Dear believers, don't look to yourself. You're not strong enough. You don't have it within you to overcome what comes against you. Looking to yourself will either end in number one, arrogance, thinking that you are good enough, you can overcome, or in despair, loathing yourself, realizing that you're, you can't do anything. I would say both of those are idolatry of self. They focus on you. And again, I'm not excusing us. We should be active people, but we have to be empowered by God and His Spirit. I would say also don't look to others. Don't look to others thinking that they can be your solution. They can be part of the process. They can be part of the comfort and encouragement that comes. But they can't fix your ultimate problems either. And by the way, don't look at them and think that they're your enemies. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's amazing how quickly we'll assign blame to other individuals. It takes us all the way back to Genesis 3, doesn't it? Who told you? It was this woman you gave me. It was this serpent that you placed here. It's interesting, isn't it, how ultimately it goes back to blaming God, the woman that you gave me. Don't blame your spouse. Don't blame your children. Don't blame your parents. Don't blame your friends and don't blame your foes and don't blame God. My heart goes out especially to those who have been hurt so severely that now they start to build a wall around themselves. And all the while they're building it to protect themselves, we understand that in their own little safe space, but they're isolating themselves. And they're going to find in the end that they're all alone. And that's not how God has equipped us or designed us. He wants us to be in community with one another. We need one another, but ultimately, ultimately, we have to look to the Lord. He is our light and our salvation. He is the strength of our life. And we want to be in His house forever, and we want to behold His beauty. So I say look to Him long enough, look to Him often enough so that we see His beauty, a beauty that goes beyond anything else that we see. Our desires, our affections will be firmly placed upon Him, the one who is more desired than anything or anything else. You see, when you find that which is most beautiful, that's what you long for. It requires that we look. When we understand that Christ is our all in all, our light and our salvation, the strength of our life. We want to be near Him. We want to be with Him. Go with me to John 21. John 21. I was trying to find an illustration, an example of someone wanting to be near to the Lord. And there were several that I, I came across. But I came to this one because in context, there's a, there's a second part of the illustration I think that's befitting for us. It's, it's, you're not going to be surprised when you get there. It's Simon Peter. Simon Peter was one of those guys who... You know, it's kind of like ready, shoot, and then aim, right? He was always doing, sometimes before he thought. And in this case, it was one of those occasions. Christ has risen from the dead, and uh, they've gone back to the, what they used to do. They're actually out fishing, and Christ appears to them at the sea. John 21, verse 7. But when the morning, now, uh, when ha when, when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. 
And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were, not, they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple who writes this account, the disciple whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now this is interesting. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. <laughs> Could you imagine him? Now I'm going to throw on my outer garment, and I'm going to swim to the shore to be with Jesus Christ. That's where he wanted to be. He wanted to be near him. But what, the reason I brought us to this example is because of what happens after they eat breakfast together. You recall that Simon Peter, on one hand, he was right on track. On the other, he was off, right? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus, do you really think this is the best route for you to die at Calvary, right? He was told he would deny the Lord. He did. And yet, on this occasion, the Lord, in restoration, digs deep into his affections. By the way, for those of you who like to study, it's a very interesting play on words in this particular exchange. I won't explain it now, but you can look into it. Just notice the simplicity of it down in verse 14, or verse 15. Now, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, Son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. I like this illustration. Again, you can dig into the text of it. It's really fascinating. I like the fact that we're reminded that we're a work in progress. We've not yet arrived. Like Simon Peter, we want to be with the Lord. But our affections, there's still more work to do. So we set our gaze upon Him, but we also must seek His face. So let's go back to the psalm now. I think it is a good thing for us that the Word of God is living. It's not a textbook that gives us answers if we're in seminary taking a test or a catechism lesson. Um, if it were, it'd probably be a lot shorter with just doctrinal statements. Uh, verses 1 through 6 would be con concise and it would have been less. But rather, the Word of God is penned by frail humans in the midst of their journey, during their times of grappling with the truth, inspired by God all the while so that we see that they, like we, can know the truth, we can be confident in the Lord, and yet, we still cry out to Him because we need Him. So the second half reminds us to seek His face. And by the way, to me, it's kind of a call back to the garden in creation. To walk with the Lord in the cool of the day. To be close to Him and just walk near to Him and delight in His presence. It is important in this next section for me to mention that what David cries out, the desire of his heart that we'll see here, is something that the Lord commands. And I think that's significant because if the Lord did not command it, we would not know that we are to do this. So He bids us come, but He also gives us the strength to do it. So again, any good desire we have comes from Him. So notice David's cry in verses 7 through 12. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witness have risen against me and such as breathe out violence. It's such an interesting intermingling here, isn't it? Confidence in the Lord and yet crying out to God. I would ask, have you ever been there? Have you ever done this? Have you ever felt like David, that you know the Lord, you know who He is, He's your light, He's your salvation, the strength of your life. You, he has delivered you in the past. You know it, it is certain. And you are striving, you're forgetting those things in the past, pressing on. But have there been times when in that moment all alone you just cry out and you cry out for mercy 
Dear God, please help me. Dear God, please hear me. Oh God, please don't leave me. Please hold me fast. Dear God, either please use me or let this come to an end. It is enough. Dear God, please forgive me again. Please don't turn away in anger. Oh God, please teach me, mold me, make me. Please don't let me be the one who dishonors you. Please keep me from selfishness and foolishness. God, please protect me from those who've lied about me, for those who've wanted to harm me. Dear God, I feel alone. I feel like I've been abandoned. I know I'm your child. I come unworthy. I cling only to your cross. I claim only your blood, your precious blood. I wonder how often do we feel like Paul in Romans. The very things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things that I want to do, I don't do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? God and God alone. But God, He calms our fears. He triumphs over our anxieties. And we can look to Him with confidence. We know that He is able. There's something in this psalm that I want to point out to you that I find to be kind of a little extra. It's like a cherry on the top in this psalm. It's one of those things that doesn't need to be said because it's said in so many other places, but I find it really refreshing. It's found in verse 9. In the midst of crying out, he says, Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me. And here's the phrase, O God of my salvation. O God of my salvation. This is a shift. He has said, the Lord is my salvation. Now in verse 9, he says, God of my salvation. Why? Why does David make this shift? Why does he appeal to Elohim rather than Jehovah in this one particular place? This is the only place that the name Elohim appears in this psalm. Every other time, it's Jehovah. Why the name change? Well, just by way of reminder, the very first mention of God in Scripture is Elohim in Genesis chapter 1. And it's a reference to the fact that He is the Creator. It's not until Genesis 2 with the specifics of the creation of man that Jehovah comes in. Jehovah is the covenantal name. Elohim is the almighty name. So God, who brings us into covenant with Himself, is able to maintain covenant for us. You see, Jehovah brings us in kindness and mercy. He saves us. The same God, Elohim, almighty power, keeps us. It's the sweet mercy of God and the almighty power of God. And David's confidence in the Lord included not just the here and now, but the future as well. Look at verse 13 again. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. To gaze upon His beauty, to seek His face, but to be confident that there will come a day when I see His goodness in the land of the living for all eternity, forevermore. It is this understanding of future grace a final salvation that should strengthen us for our journey that's sometimes uncertain and oftentimes painful. Let's just put it into context for the whole psalm. What was his question at the beginning? Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? If we want to amplify in the, in the context, what's the worst thing that anyone can do to us? What's the very worst thing that anyone can do to us? Could they take our possessions, our worldly goods? Yeah, they could, right? That's a possibility. So what? I still have Christ, both now and forevermore. This is riches untold. If you want to talk about prosperity theology, that's it. Christ and Christ alone. That is great prosperity. Could they increase my pain? Could they cause me to suffer greatly in this world? Yes, it's possible. But what do we know? We consider this present suffering to be nothing with the glory which will be revealed in eternity. This too shall pass. Could they end your life? Could they snuff it out? Yes, it is a possibility. But we can affirm to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because we still have Christ. Nothing that I mentioned 
loss of possession, increased pain, even the end of life. These are not things that we desire. We're not longing for them. But dear believers, isn't it true what e'er my God ordains is right? And though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. In this I am confident. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I be afraid of? The response of David in verse 14 kind of echoes back to verse 6, but it's a call. Verse 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I think what David does here as he closes this out, I think he's coaching himself. I think he's saying to himself, i got to wait upon the Lord. i got to be of good, good courage. i gotta, I got to be strengthened by Him. But I think he's calling out to others to do the same. And I say, wait upon the Lord. He will strengthen us. We really need this, don't we? Don't we need psalms like these that help us? Some days I feel like it's about 6 o'clock at night and I'm ready to call it a day. You ever been there? I am tired, I am weary, and sometimes I'm fretful. Now i got to tell you, sometimes it's 10.30. 10.30 in the morning, and I feel like it's already been long enough, I'm ready to call it a day. I think about days like that. I think about psalms like Psalm 27. And then I'm thankful that we can sing songs with lyrics, like we're going to close out today. This song was played last week um, somewhere in the, in the music mix, and I just started to hear the words, and I mentioned it, and immediately our musician said, well, we're going to close out our service this week with it. Written over 100 years ago, there is a place of comfort sweet and full release near to the heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace, and we, our Savior, meet near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before Thee near to the heart of God. And another song came to my mind this week as I was thinking about these truths. It was a song that closed out so many services, again, written right about 100 years ago. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, a life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Fellow believers, we know we have to draw near. We know we have to set our gaze upon Him. We have to behold His beauty. We have to seek His face. He alone is our light and our salvation. He is the strength of our life. So be encouraged. The One who saved you will save you. He will keep you. And He will bring you home to see His goodness in the land of the living. I don't want to read the entire psalm, but I want to read a couple of verses again. So if you don't mind, please stand with me and we'll close out our service today. Just a few verses again from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Together, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Together, of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. In the time of trouble, He shall hide me in His pavilion, in the secret place of His tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer the sacrifices of joy in His tabernacle together. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You that You do in fact give us the words that we need in, our, in the time of need, in our, in our struggles, when we're grappling with things and we find that within us our souls are disquieted, they are disturbed, they're unsettled. Thank You, Lord, that You bid us come. Thank You, Lord, that You command that we gaze upon You and draw near and seek Your face. And thank You, Lord, that You empower us to do the same. Thank you, God, for saving my soul. Thank you, God, for making me whole. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.